The next time you find yourself in the West Village, maybe take a few moments to go to the corner of LaGuardia Place and West Houston Street, where there's a work by Alan Sanfist, one of the early uh, land, uh, land artists or earth artists um, from, from the 1960s. And this is a work called Time Landscape, which is still there. Uh, the idea for it started in 1965, and he completes it in 1978, but it's an ongoing work because the work itself is vegetation. Uh, so it's a small little ecosystem that has been preserved. So it's a plot of land in New York City that he wanted to, to be wild or natural, right? Um, so this is, a, this is a really a beautiful poetic work in many ways. We almost want to think of it as a memorial for nature or for wildness within our cityscape uh, because he made a very conscious decision to get vegetation that was uh, indigenous to this area before colonization, uh, so pre-Columbian vegetation that would have been here, um, you know, centuries, centuries before uh, Europeans came um, and, and founded, you know, New Amsterdam and then, and then New York City and I'm making a long history very short there. Um, but in, in, in essence, he's quote, kind of memorializing nature and the wild here. So on the one hand, this work is about nature, and it has a certain conception of nature that we might want to talk about a bit more and unpack. But it seems to be a conception of nature as, as separate from the city, um, as, as, uh, as, as wild, um, as something on the other side of, of culture, um, and something that needs to, to be protected and partitioned. So in that way, uh, it has a very um, romantic conception of nature. We're going to talk about this today a little bit. Um, our views of nature in the West are largely conditioned by the view of nature that, that was articulated, that was formalized within the Romantic period uh, way back in the, um, in the early 19th century. So nature as wild, as untrammeled, um, as something uh, beyond the city, beyond culture, beyond society. What we're doing today is questioning this conception of nature and asking ourselves a few questions. Like, one, is this conception of nature really natural? Um, is this conception of nature immutable? Um, is this conception of nature even coherent? Um, we're going to start picking apart the idea and the concept of nature Getting to our um, um, getting to our theme for this class, which is the post natural. So you have artists, you have philosophers, you have thinkers who are starting to think uh, that nature maybe is getting in our way. Uh, maybe it's not a productive category. Uh, maybe it's actually a destructive category. Maybe maybe it's uh, it's not helping. Um, and so we have to think within post natural terms, um, which can mean a number of things. And we're gonna we're gonna lay these out today in what I hope is, is, a, is a really interesting way. And so first, before we talk about po post-natural, I think when we, when we look at Alan Sonfist's work, I think we have to ask ourselves, and it comes up naturally, um, what is natural? What, what, what is nature? And so the first thing I did to s start thinking about this is I went to a classic source, the Oxford English Dictionary. So if you're ever looking for the etymology of a word, in English, when it was first used, all its multiple meanings, sort of the rich history of, of, of certain words, which can really come in, in handy when you're doing research, uh, not only in this class, but really anything that you do. If there's a key word that you're trying to think through, one of the great ways to start is to go to the Oxford English Dictionary and see all the different entries and all the ways that the word has been used throughout the, the English language. Um, and so it's pretty incredible. When you go to the Oxford in English Dictionary, there are 21 different entries. Um, and th these include definitions that are both still in use, they still make sense to us, uh, and others that are really kind of on left, uh, out of left field, or even maybe no longer in, in use in sort of the, the living aspects of, of the English language. So I'm certainly not going to go in and, and list all of them, but here are some of the definitions of how the word natural has been used or is used. 
So one definition goes, the inborn mental or physical endowments of a person. So like the natural state of a, of a human being. Another uh, is, is uh, a definition of something that's in a purely natural condition, uh, which uh, sort of begs the question, because it's using the word natural in the definition of natural, uh, but it goes on then to say it's something that's not altered or improved in any way. Another de definition has to do more with abnormality and disease and illness, uh, things that, you know, we don't even use the word abnormal very much anymore. So this definition is a little, feels a little old, but quote unquote, normal bodily features or characteristics. Um, so natural, uh, an understanding of the natural, of the, of the human body, or really any body, as this normative thing, like there are perfect forms in nature, and then sometimes because of disease or, 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 uh, or whatever else, abnormalities come about. Um, then things start getting weird. Uh, there's, there's an entry where natural used to mean the genitals. Um, there's an entry where natural used to mean a mistress, someone's mistress. Uh, there's uh, an entry where natural was the, the a word for a style of a type of wig that was made from human hair. Um, and then there are others, the other definitions which, which are a little bit more within certain fields uh, that you may or may not know. So the natural scale in music, which are all the white keys on the piano, that's called the natural scale. Um, in mathematics, the natural numbers are the whole numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then blah, 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 blah. Um, that, those are called the, the natural numbers. Um, then there's a, a definition of the natural as something being real, um, as opposed to, I suppose, unreal or fake. Um, the real thing or a real person or real life. Um, and then another one, I think, which is important to point out, is the use of the, to, the word natural to denote someone who's native of a place or a country. Uh, so just think about it. I remember when I became a U.S. citizen, um, when I moved, moved here from France a long time ago, uh, what was my ceremony called when I became a citizen? It was a naturalization ceremony, right? So to become naturalized is to become a, a citizen of, uh, of a place or a country. So I've just given you a few of these definitions, but you can see how wide-ranging and how uh, malleable the term natural is is and there's a really great philosopher his name is timothy morton um, and he's probably done the most in in trying to think through uh, a post-natural future um, and to do this of course he then asks himself well what is what do we mean by nature and why is it maybe a limitation or, or a flaw in our thinking and he says something interesting in his book called ecology without nature um, he says, quote, uh, nature occupies at least three places in our language. Um, first, it's merely an empty placeholder for a host of other concepts. And so I think we saw that from, from the, 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 the definition of the Oxford, all those definitions from the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, second, the nature is the force of a law or a norm against which deviation is measured. And this is one of the definitions that we were just looking at. And I think it's a really important one to look at because whenever you think of the word uh, nature or when you think of something being natural, um, you, you are, whether you know it or not, tapping into a long history of the idea of natural laws, the idea that there are natural laws um, that, that, we have to, um, that we have to abide by and, and, and command. Um, and then third, nature as a Pandora's box, a word that encapsulates a potentially infinite series of dis disparate fantasy objects. So this sounds a little bit more opaque, the way he's describing this, but I guess what I want you to think of here, uh, I think what he's trying to say, is that the word nature almost becomes uh, an idea that can be invested with all sorts of meanings that come from, um, from certain desires. And so each culture, it's very likely that each culture will have a, a, a specific conception of nature um, that fits along with the, the desires of that, that society, the way they see themselves, the way they see their traditions and, and, the, and their cultures. So this is, all, this is all really important. And I hope 
um, the beginning of this session, it's it's a bit heady and we're it's it's a bit textual, and I promise we're going to get to more examples. But the word nature and natural is so loaded, and we could spend hours unpacking it, and 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 seeing how it's meant so many different things to so many different people, how it's encoded in the way we talk, it's encoded in way in the ways we we look at the world, um, in such a way that we think is kind of fixed, but in fact, um, it's it's conditioned. Um, and I think this gets us then to another really important uh, idea about nature and, uh, and, and, and the natural. Because you may have heard the, the, the term, oh yeah, it's only natural that we do this, right? Um, using the word natural in that sense. Um, and that gets to a definition of the natural as ideology. So ideology is a difficult term to define. But the way I want you to think about ideology is simply a set of ideas that people hold without knowing really why they hold them. Um, these ideas can simply be dogmatic or just traditional. Um, there are these type of ideas that are in the air, in culture, that have just always been there, um, and they're left, uh, they're, they're left uncritically examined, right? So these are like... Think of the received ideas of any one culture, and I imagine you can think of all sorts of all sorts of examples of this within uh, within the United States in our, in our own time. All the ways in which we think certain things are only natural, um, and you don't even have to question them, right? Um, that go way beyond questions of nature and wildness, right? So this definition of natural is about all the things that just seem natural to us, and so we don't question them. This is, this is the definition of ideology. When you go back and you read Marx on ideology, his definition of it is basically the ideas that people have without knowing that they have those ideas. But nonetheless, they condition the way they think and the, they condition the way they act, right? So this is a conception of nature and natural as dogmatic. It's almost like a default mental pattern, right? And how many examples could, could, could we think of? Um, uh, could we think of this? I, I mean, I would think all the packaging on food where you see all, you know, like all natural. Um, I think that's ideological. I think there's a, I think if, if you talk about food being all natural, it's largely, it's largely meaningless um, other than the general tendency to think of natural food as, as being a food that's either, um, uh, hasn't been in any way altered um, or, uh, or, or refined um, um, or, or adulterated. Uh, but really, people, um, advertising companies and, 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 and uh, food corporations, they use the term all natural to mean all sorts of different things, and we don't really quite think about it. We, uh, people probably just look at it and think, oh, wow, this is healthy, right? Um, but that might not necessarily be the case. Um, even if it is true that probably the, the least, uh, the, the least uh, refined um, and the least worked over your food has been, the more it's a whole food, the, the more likely it's, it's healthy for you. Uh, but there are all sorts of things in nature that haven't been uh, altered or refined or processed. Um, I mean, think of morphine. It comes from a poppy plant, right? Um, morphine is incredibly addictive and dangerous, right? You make people make heroin out of out of morphine. Um, um, so just because it's unadulterated and so so called found in nature and natural doesn't necessarily mean it's good for us, right? Then on the other side of things, there are all sorts of things out there that we think, well, it's only natural that that they're there. It's only natural that it's this way, uh, but in fact, it's not. It's not natural at all. So all. I, I, I totally recommend reading up on the history of squirrels in Central Park. It's pretty wild. Uh, you might think that squirrels are sim have simply always been here and they've always, you know, like lived, lived a happy life in the park. That is not at all the case. Um, they were abundant here uh, in, in, in colonial times. Uh, people would shoot them and eat them. Um, and there's another example of something being natural that becomes unnatural. I don't think anybody eat squirrels anymore. Um, I even heard a story about an army vet in 2010 
on Long Island who shot a squirrel and then went to jail for 30 days for having shot that squirrel. If you go back a few centuries, people were shooting squirrels all the time and eating them, right? So the idea of, of what we eat, um, whether or not we eat animals or not, um, which type of animals we're, we're, we're taught to eat, all, none of that is natural. All of that is ideological um, um, according to traditions and according to uh, sort of the normative behavior of any one time or place, right? Uh, but read up on the history of squirrels. It's pretty fascinating. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were almost brought to extinction. Um, and then uh, people in the 19th century who were influenced by sort of the Victorian aesthetics of nature, they realized, oh, man, it'd be really nice to have squirrels here. Uh, and so they were brought over and reintroduced uh, into, um, in, into the park. So one of the, one of the many other uh, ways in which we can talk about natural and post-natural is to start thinking about invasive species and all the ways in which what we think is natural in our city, in our state, in our country. Um, it, you, we will be very surprised to learn how a lot of the stuff that we think is natural was actually at once uh, in the past an invasive species. Uh, I just learned recently that earthworms are not indigenous to this area. They were uh, invasive uh, species. Um, there are tons and tons of examples of this. So this long introduction, which I know is very textual, it's a bit heady, uh, but I hope you find it interesting just to unpack this term natural uh, and nature and to think about all the ways in which it's so loaded and it's so loose and so malleable. It means so many things to so many different people uh, that this is setting up our session because we're now going to think about, okay, natural beyond natural, natural beyond nature, ecology beyond nature, um, and the post-natural condition. And so one way in which we might think of the, the post-natural, um, and I think it's, it's really important to do this, is to think of other cultures that have not really had our the Western conception of nature as something that's on the other side of culture, that's distinct from human society, um, and something that's you know out there that needs to be managed and kept wild. Um, and we find many examples of this. Um, we can find examples of this within indigenous traditions in this country. Um, and I wanted to give you an example of this from a, a really wonderful work from an artist, his name is Alan Michelson. Uh, he's a New York-based Mohawk member of the Six Nations of the Grand River. Um, so he's a First Nations uh, indigenous artist. Um, and he did a work, it was shown at the, the, the Whitney. It's a video work uh, and you can see it online if you're interested, just search for Alan Michelson, Wolf Nation. It's a really lovely video work. Uh, it looks like this, it's in purple. Um, it's it's a, a, a webcam footage of red wolves who are critically in, endangered. Uh, they're in critically endangered, uh, endangered species who are very important to um, the, the traditions uh, and, and uh, the, the spiritual lives of First Nations peoples um, going, going way back, um, specifically of the, the Lenape people um, who were dispossessed from, um, from, where, from where we live or where I'm speaking right now, New York, and, and New Jersey. Um, and so this is an example of, of, of envisioning nature uh, beyond something that's simply out there. Uh, and this all conjoins to the, to the ideas that we had started talking about in the animal lecture, uh, because post-natural in many ways means post-humanist. Uh, getting getting away from the notion that humans are on one side and then non-humans are on the other, or humans are superior and non-humans are are inferior, uh, and can just be you know can just be killed and treated treated um, in any old way. Um, this is not at all how indigenous peoples thought of wolves, um, who, who are again very important animals for their traditions um, and and their 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 spiritual their spiritual uh, lives. Um, and so Alan Michelson here is making a connection or an analogy between uh, the eradication of red wolves, uh, which has led to all sorts of problems, not only for the red, from the red wolves themselves, but also for deer populations. Uh, if we think that it's natural for deer to be everywhere, 
uh, and overpopulated, which leads to all, to all sorts of problems, um, not only to, to, to deer, but to humans and, and, uh, and um, vegetation. Uh, well, that's because we unnaturally called all these wolves um, who otherwise lived in a, a more symbiotic existence with, with, with deer. Um, so already we're getting into the idea of, of what seems to be natural is actually uh, not so natural and maybe towards a post-natural condition here. Uh, but he's making an, an analogy between the eradication of wolves and the eradication of humans that lived in the in the same area. So the eradication of indigenous peoples, um, and and the 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 eradication of critic of now critically endangered wolves. So this is this is a work that forms solidarity between human and non-human, which goes goes well beyond a Western conception of nature, right? So maybe if we start thinking about post-natural or getting away from conceptions of of Western uh, nature, maybe one way to do this is to start studying and start looking at artists and thinkers who are steeped within the tradition of non-Western conceptions of the natural um, and, of, and of nature, which is going to be very distinct, right? I wanted to give you another example. Uh, this is quite an amazing story. Um, in 2020, uh, 24, uh, on September 24th, 2020, members of the Lumi Nation, um, which means people of the sea, and they live on the west, on the Pacific, in the Pacific Northwest. They traveled to SeaWorld in Florida, and they had a ceremony um, that that uh, that had to do with uh, an orca, with a killer whale. Uh, that SeaWorld had named Lolita, but then the Lumi uh, Nation wanted to rename her um, so that it would more closely align with where she should be. Um, the waters off the Pacific Northwest, where she was, where she was taken um, by um, um, by SeaWorld. Um, so they named her Scali Chartanat, Scali um, uh, um, Chartanat. Um, and so they had a they had a a, a, a ceremony renaming her, um, and uh, they're trying to legally get her out of SeaWorld and back into her home waters, um, where they have, again, a conception, not unlike wolves here, there's a conception of killer whales as kin, as basically part of, of the family of the, the lumination uh, in the Pacific Northwest. So again, this is a conception of nature, and in this case of a, of a cetacean mammal, not as this thing out there that's wild and that's completely divorced from human interests, but one in which actually there's an entanglement, like there's there's a connection between orca communities and human communities, right? Uh, so for SeaWorld, this is just uh, uh, an animal that, I mean, you know, they, they say that they're um, they're conserving uh, these animals, uh, but 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 these are animals that just can't live like like this. Um, so it's hard not to think of this as a form of exploitation. Um, as a form of putting, um, I would argue, someone uh, in conditions that are unlivable for them, um, and all sorts of pathologies develop, um, and illnesses and shortened lives. Um, if you're interested in this, I highly recommend the film Blackfish, which is very good about um, orcas in, in captivity. Um, so all this to, to give us another example of getting away from well, nature as a spectacle, as something that can be contained, um, as something that can just be enjoyed, and moving towards a, a, a conception of nature, or arguably with in, in relation to the Western context, a relation of, of post-nature, where nature is no longer something that is, is, um, uh, can be kept at arm's length or is distinct from us, but actually is uh, entangled with us um, and is a part of... of of our own self-conception, as it is for for the Lumi for the Lumi Nation. There's another philosopher. Her name is Donna Haraway, who's associated with these post-natural ideas, uh, and 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 one of the central terms that she's coined is nature culture. Uh, so rather than having a hyphen between nature and culture, where nature is on one side and culture is on the other. 
the word nature culture helps us emphasize all the ways in which what we used to think was out there in nature and we were here within culture are actually stuck together, are actually entangled in many, in many ways, right? Um, and through, you know, uh, uh, breakthroughs in genomics, uh, in genetics, um, through breakthroughs in understanding our own bodies uh, as actually largely non-human, um, all the cells in our guts, in our gut biomes, which really condition our moods and the way we think, um, all of those outnumber all the, the human cells in our body, right? Um, so there's a lot of us that's actually, uh, it's, it's weird to think about it, but there's a lot of our bodies that, that's actually non-human um, and dependent on these, on these non-humans, right? Um, so in a post-natural condition, one of the one of the ways uh, we have to start thinking about what it means to be a human is that we're not some self-contained thing. Uh, we're not some self-contained identity where we're where uh, we're one hundred percent human and enclosed from the world. No, we have to think ourselves as utterly entangled and dependent on a whole host of things that are outside of us that we used to think was just like natural. So I mean, just think of food. Uh, but then also think of all the viruses, the fungi, the bacteria, all the things in your body um, without which you would not be able to live. You would not be able to live as a human creature, right? So once we start thinking of us, ourselves in this way, we're really, uh, we're really um, uh, moved away from the idea of the human as, as a purely social, cultural uh, 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 entity that's, uh, that's outside of nature. We're thinking of the human as totally entangled with all sorts of non-humans. Um, and if, if you have a companion species, if you have a pet, uh, um, or what, whatever that pet might be, there are all sorts of ways in which you've created a link and an entanglement with that dog or cat or parrot or, or, or guinea pig or whatever, whatever uh, they might be uh, that has conditioned both you and them, um, both emotionally, psychologically, but also physically. Uh, so it's an amazing thing to think about. And there are a number of artists that have, that have worked uh, on this question or point us into this, this question. Um, so now we're going to get to some, some examples. Uh, this is Caitlin Berrigan, uh, who has a, a, a liver condition that she needs to, uh, that, that needs to get, get treated. Um, and so she did a work based on this. It's a really uh, wonderful work. Um, a, w a work that has to do with giving in many in many ways, um, and so what 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 it is? It's called Life Cycle of a Common Weed from two thousand seven, um, and she takes for her the life giving nutrients of dandelion, which uh, it's been well known for a long time that dandelion is very good for our, our livers, uh, which is wild because you know it's just this common weed out there. Or you could go to Central Park and pick dandelion and make yourself a salad if you wanted to. Um, so it's very good for, for her, her liver. Um, but she doesn't stop there. She doesn't show how dandelion is good for her. You know, she eats the dandelion um, and, it, and it's good for her liver condition. She actually gives back to the dandelion uh, with her blood. She draws blood and the nitrogen in her blood goes back into the soil uh, and renews the dandelion, which um, uh, I, the very little I know about farming, I know that nitrogen is important for uh, fertilization and, and proper soil and so on and so forth. So this is not only about the dandelion entering into the body of the artist, but also the artist's body entering into the body of the dandelion, right? So what a beautiful work to show the ways in which we are entangled with all sorts of non-humans um, out, there, out there in the world. In this example, uh, dandelion, a weed, but we could come up with all sorts of examples um, that, that are that are quite quite similar, if not so obvious and thematized as this work um, wants to, wants to, wants to show and make visible. Um, there's a, I, I think, kind of a similar work which is uh, was was very controversial. Uh, it's by Maya Smrekar, a, a, Slo a Slovenian artist. Who's done a lot of work with with dogs, with her with her own dogs, um, her, um, uh, her 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 companion species. Um, and and one of the works she did uh, is called Hybrid Family, uh, which started in two thousand fourteen. And what this work consisted of is her taking uh, hormones in order to facilitate lactation, breast breastfeeding. 
Um, and then uh, breastfeeding uh, a, a puppy, um, uh, one, one, of her, one of her puppies. And so on the one hand, I find this to be a fascinating work to talk about, um, and a lot of people are usually taken aback. In Slovenia, this was a very controversial work. She got a lot of resistance, especially from kind of extreme uh, right-wing politics who, who, who found the work to be unnatural and against family values and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I can see that. Um, I can see how this, this, this work could be... Uh, uh, could could feel like wow this is really weird this is not something that 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 we should we should be doing this feels really unnatural right but then I think there's another way to think about it uh, which is uh, which is which which affords us a way to question what we deem to be unnatural right um, what are the reasons that that this is un unnatural um, might be interesting uh, um, interesting thing to, to think through. There are some um, who argue that the very beginnings of domestication between human and dogs going way, way back uh, thousands uh, thousands of years may have begun because of orphaned young puppies, wolf cubs, um, who were then taken in by human communities and would have been nursed by women. In those communities who were also, uh, you know, uh, nursing their own uh, babies. And so I'm thinking if you're living, uh, you know, uh, thousands of years ago, the very beginnings of, of uh, the domestication of dogs in these communities, uh, maybe they didn't have a conception of nature as being different from their culture. Maybe they didn't have a conception of the human uh, as, uh, as distinct from all other animals. Maybe this was simply a way of, of taking care. Uh, of caring for you know a, a little puppy that need that need that needs a family, uh, and maybe it was totally natural to breastfeed, um, to, to breastfeed a dog, um, um, and so there now we're starting to think oh wait maybe it's not as unnatural as we think, uh, and the impulse that uh, even I have when I think about this work I think oh this is really uh, this is really strange, I have to check myself and think well why do I think it's strange why do I think it's unnatural. Um, and then the reasons for it seeming unnatural, they start to get, uh, they start to crumble a little bit. Um, what if this is just a moment of care? Um, what if, uh, what if this is a work that actually uh, is about nurture, nurturing, is about caring, um, and that there's actually no, uh, no one's being hurt by it, right? Uh, maybe instead of thinking of, of the terms natural and unnatural, maybe we should think of terms as uh, violent and nonviolent. Right, um, and so I can't help but think that uh, um, a lot of people were troubled by this work, um, were um, found it to be uh, scandalous or unnatural, uh, and then yet maybe that morning they had uh, cow milk with their with their cereal, right, um, as a seemingly totally natural thing, um, which you know uh, taking um, lactating liquid from a mammal. Uh, has been done for centuries, uh, not in the volume it is now, that's for sure, uh, but by, not by all peoples. By no means have all human beings done this and all cultures uh, done this. So uh, milk may very well be uh, an unnatural thing uh, for uh, cow's milk, may very well be an unnatural liquid for a lot of people in history and even a lot of people in the, in the, world, uh, in, in the world today. Um, and there we have an example, arguably, where uh, someone is getting hurt uh, because if you've ever seen cows in the dairy industry, it definitely doesn't seem like a fun uh, a fun life um, as opposed to this little puppy who's just being taken care of. So this is a really rich work that really starts to make us question natural and unnatural um, in ways that are that are that are kind of fascinating and really get us to, to sort of like be critical about our own assumptions. Um, also. When, we, when we're talking about this interaction between human and, and non-human animals, um, I think we, we also have to think about all the ways in which uh, we, we already uh, manipulate uh, uh, animal life in all sorts of ways in science and in the food industry. Um, and so one, one example would be the Onco Mouse from 1988, uh, which was the first transgenic 
a transgenic animal to be patent. Uh, transgenic is, is a technology where you go in and you start working with the genes of, of a creature um, so that they develop certain traits artificially. So this has been done for centuries through breeding, through selective breeding, but this is the, the first time where you can start messing with the genes not by breeding, uh, but by going in there and actually working with the, the genetic material itself through, you know, through scientific breakthroughs in biotechnology. So the Anka Mouse is the first to be patented in 1988 by Harvard University, and it's still used. Uh, imagine all the Anka Mice that were, that were made um, because they're modified to create a specific gene that will let, then lead to cancer. So they're predisposed to, to getting diseased, to, to getting cancer, um, so that they can then be used in research. So if this is not an example of nature culture, of I mean, I don't even know where nature would begin and end and where culture would begin and end in here. This is an object, this is a creature that's a product of nature culture. Uh, it's a product of both, both human science, but then also natural, you know, the natural evolution of mice, of, of, of rodents. Um, so like Maya Schmecker's work, uh, we've been crossing the species barrier and, and doing things um, um, to non-human animals in all sorts of ways well before, well before that work. And so here we, 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 we might ask, like, is this natural or unnatural? Um, maybe that's even an unhelpful question, right? Maybe we need to be thinking of this in post-natural terms where we, like I said before, we want to think of the acromice as a product of both science and, uh, um, and uh, unadulterated life, right, uh, um, of, of, of evolution. There's another uh, example of this. I have things out of sequence here. Um, but Dolly, who you may have heard of, was the first sheep to be cloned in 1997. Um, <clears throat> so the process of cloning is, is also uh, this, this way in which we manipulate so-called you know, natural, a natural life cycle. Uh, so Dolly was also a product of nature, nature culture. Um, and there was an artist, there is an artist, Eduardo uh, Katch, who did a very famous, also notorious um, um, example, a uh, notorious work called G GPF Bunny, uh, where he worked with scientists in France to create uh, a transgenic rabbit, and her name was Alba. Uh, they spliced the genes of a rabbit with the genes of a bioluminescent jellyfish, so that Alba, when she grew up, uh, if she was put under the right light, she would glow like bioluminescent um, uh, jellyfish that glow under, under, underwater. Um, this was a very controversial work, uh, and the French state even seized the, the rabbit, um, and the artist never saw her again, and we're not, actually not sure where, uh, where she went. Um, so this is, an, this is another example uh, of, of, of a post-natural animal, of an animal that's both a product of scientific technology, uh, but also, of course, a product of "quote unquote" natural evolution, if if you will, the evolution of of, of rabbits. Um, and we should also keep in mind uh, that even though Eduardo's catch GPF bunny was was controversial, and a lot of people thought this is something that an artist should not be doing. You shouldn't be messing with life like this. Um, and there may be there may be merit to those to those criticisms. Um, I think we shouldn't delude ourselves to the ways in which f the food industries, um, um, especially um, animal um, big animal agriculture, uh, has been doing this for a long long time. Um, again, through through selective breeding, but also through novel biotechnologies of making pigs bigger, of making um, making uh, chickens grow so fast that, that actually they can't live beyond a certain age because they won't even be able to hold themselves up so that they produce more meat. Um, all these techniques of manipulating life are, uh, are, are well established um, within, with, within the history of, of agriculture. And the same goes for, um, for, for plant agriculture. And so you think of the use of pesticides, of, of genetic modification, um, of, of pest resistant seeds, all these things. And, you know, these are, you go out, you look at a field growing corn, you think, oh, what a beautiful natural landscape. But in fact, it's not 
totally natural. Um, it's in it's it's in many ways a product of society and scientific uh, scientific undertakings, right? So this is what I mean by thinking in post natural terms, like thinking of of the world outside of society and of humanity, not as separate and as distinct, but uh, a place that has all sorts of connections to human endeavors um, and entanglements with 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 human endeavors, uh, because we have to eat plants, right? Uh, there's there's no there's no choice there, um, and so uh, we are ingesting <clears throat> um, all sorts of products that may very well have been uh, manipulated in in some ways, and the debates about genetic modification, uh, whether or not they're necessary to feed people uh, because of the volume that we need, whether or not they're bad for us. All these things are debates that, that are unfolding. And some people argue that uh, uh, genetic modification is harmless and it helps feed people. Other people argue that, no, you should have organic food and you should not be uh, eating genetically modified, modified um, uh, plants. Um, these are part of the debates that are happening right now. Um, and I don't think we can understand these debates with the old conception of nature. Um, I think we have to think in post-natural terms. And so here is we, where we get to the more big picture stuff, right? Uh, this is where we get to the idea of ecology um, and nature. So I think for, the, for quite some time, environmentalism and ecology was working with a conception of nature that was rather traditional. Um, and by traditional, I mean uh, the conception of nature that begins in Romanticism, where it's something that we should leave wild, untouched, um, uh, and free from human intervention. Um, and also the idea of nature as something that's sublime or beautiful, right? Uh, where we have a certain conception of nature that goes back centuries that oh, you go out to the park, you go out for a hike, and it's like this beautiful thing. It's a remedy for living in a city. It's a remedy for a stressed out life. Um, and I don't want to downplay that. I really think it is. Um, I, I was just listening to a new record by a Japanese musician uh, that was inspired by nature bathing, which is something that's done in Japan, where you go out and you, you, you just lay in a forest and you bathe in the forest. And of course, in our most stressed out moments as you know, living in New York City, uh, yes, I could use a bit of that sometimes, right? Um, so nature can definitely be this, this remedy um, and this, this point of, of quieting down and of meditating um, and of and of uh, becoming rejuvenated th through through nature, um, but there are there are problems with this conception of nature, and this percep per perception of of ecology and the environment as something out there. The most obvious is that, and we've talked about this a lot in class, is that there's really no nature that's not touched by human activity at this point. Uh, I mean, if we even just talk about the atmosphere, every single part of the atmosphere is touched by a greenhouse gas that's been emitted by human industry. Um, there are particulate matters of plastic that they've even found in Antarctica now. It's all over the place, right? Um, so the idea of nature as something wild and something out there and beautiful and sublime, free from, from, from humanity, maybe that worked in the 19th century, but it no longer really works today. And so uh, Timothy Morton, the philosopher I was talking about at the beginning of today's session, he wrote a whole book called Ecology Without Nature, where he tries to demonstrate that our conception of nature is actually getting in the way of ecology, of, of ecological thinking and progress when it comes to environmental politics. Um, because this is another part of the story. If we're unfolding a political ecology throughout this class, inherently political ecology is post-natural because we're talking about nature as entering into the question of human politics, right? Um, so political ecology is, in, is itself, uh, using Donna Haraway's term, a form of nature culture, uh, of one thing, of one enmeshed thing. And so there are all sorts of wonderful examples I could give you about ecology and ecology without nature and problematizing this idea of, of nature as something that's out there uh, and, and pure and distinct from, from human activity. We go right back to the source here with Caspar David Friedrich, who you, you may know, um, a German painter of the early 19th century, 
uh, the height of Romanticism, and this this is his Sea of Ice from 1823 to oh typo sorry to 1824, uh, and it's a really wonderful painting that shows this uh, um, uh, this ice formation uh, that's wrecked a ship. Uh, so it, it's sort of, and you see the ship on the on the right there. It's been it's almost fully submerged underneath the ice. So this is a conception of romantic nature as awe-inspiring, as actually dominating human activity, um, and as sublime and beautiful, right? Um, which again, this is a conception of nature that would have a very long uh, uh, hold on the Western imagination. And so more recently, far more recently, an Austrian artist, his name is Matthias, Matthias Kessler, he did a work called The Sea of Ice, referencing the painting, uh, Friedrich's painting, uh, but also The Wreck of Hope from 2012. And at first you, you, you see it, it's an object in a gallery, and then you think, oh, it's just a little fridge. So you go, you're invited to open the fridge. Uh, people are invited to go in and open the fridge. And you open the fridge, and there are bottles of beer in, in the fridge. And anyone who goes to uh, the, the, the gallery and looks at this work, everyone is open, is, 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 uh, uh, is free to grab a beer, pop it open, and have a drink while looking at the art. Um, so it's, it's, it's one of these works that are, are participatory, like the, the audience interacts with the work. Um, and it's a gift. Uh, you, you get to have a free beer while looking at art. Then you can't help but notice that the top part of this fridge, as most fridges do, has a little freezer. Uh, and if you open the freezer, there's a 3D printout of Friedrich's painting, The Sea of Ice. And you can see it up there. Um, it's made of ice. And so every time someone opens the, the, the ice, where I guess normally ice cubes would be, they, they see the, the, the painting. And they change the thermal composition of the, of the freezer. All right, it warms up. The ambient air from the room goes in, and what happens? Well, the the sculpture starts to, to melt, right? And so when it gets closed, it congeals again. It starts to uh, uh, to freeze again. But of course, because it had melted, it starts to change shape. And so over the course of the the exhibition of this freezer, the more people go in and grab a beer and look at the freezer, the more uh, uh, the little sculpture of the sea of ice which is referencing Caspar David Friedrich's painting, starts to change, starts to melt, starts, starts to morph. And so this is the opposite of the conception of nature as divorced from human activity, because here just grabbing a beer, just grabbing something to, to drink, um, which of course not everyone does, but a lot of people do, and it's just like this everyday activity, uh, is preying on the integrity of this little 3D model made of ice of of Caspar David Friedrich's uh, the, the the sea of ice so nature now is at the whim of, of human activity which is much more fitting for what we talked about at the beginning of this semester of the Anthropocene and of human activity changing uh, and becoming a force on a geological scale so this is almost like uh, the Anthropocene in miniature in a fridge so really fascinating work um, and gets us thinking about, okay, nature is not something that's out there, uh, that's beautiful and sublime, uh, but nature is something that I'm actually connected to. And what I do, what I enjoy, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the energy that I use, because of course this fridge is using energy to be run, uh, is connected to this natural world that's out there, which starts to feel less less natural, if you know what I mean, right? Uh, it starts to feel uh, more like a nature culture, uh, more like a meeting place between what's inside and what's outside. So it's a fascinating work. Um, when we talk about the conception of nature uh, as, as this beautiful thing, uh, which again, it is, uh, it, it definitely can be, there are nonetheless ways in which that conception of nature gets in the way of ecological progress. And this is a wonderful example that Timothy Morton talks about in his book, uh, The Ecological Thought, where he tells a story in Scotland where there were plans to put up um, renewable energy, these big wind turbines, uh, wind turbines uh, which are one of the major solutions that we need to decarbonize our economy, to get off of fossil fuels and to move towards energy resources that are uh, truly renewable 
and not polluting. Uh, so these wind turbines are essential for uh, our ecological well-being and uh, trying to stay within a manageable limit of warming through, uh, in, this, in this century. And yet what happened? The people living there in Scotland uh, protested, and I think success successfully protested, it had to be moved or something like this, um, although the specifics I don't know about, and we'd have to look into it. Um, but they said, because it mars the beauty of the landscape, we shouldn't have these turbines, right? So this is a perfect example of this idea of nature as pure, pristine, and beautiful that's actually getting in the way of ecological progress, right? Because it hampered the creation of renewable energy in this in this case. And so Morton says something really interesting. He says, well, you know what? I think we should think of these wind turbines as a form of ecological art. <laughs> if we thought of these as sculptures in the landscape that provide renewable energy, uh, that would be a pretty potent form of, of art, right? So I found that to be a, a suggestive, a suggestive uh, statement um, on the heels of this story in Scotland and, and, these, and these wind turbines. Um, so just another, another story that shows that nature sometimes gets in the way of nature or ecology or environmental well-being, which makes us start to think about, hmm, let's move towards a post-natural world, a, a world where we start to reconceive nature as not this pristine, beautiful thing out there that we shouldn't, uh, that we shouldn't trammel. Um, there's another really wonderful work by another Austrian artist. Uh, um, his name is Martin Roth. And he did, he did the work, this is in New York, in the Austrian Cultural Forum, which is not far from MoMA in Midtown. Uh, and the work is called, in May 2017, I Cultivated a Piece of Land in Midtown Manhattan, Nurtured by Tweets. And this is on a more poetic register, but also a political register. Um, this is in the basement of the Austrian Cultural Forum, and you would walk down a set of stairs, and you would enter this space, and right off the bat, you had both signs of the natural world, because you had this beautiful lavender that was growing uh, and this dirt that was in the gallery. Uh, so the artist was cultivating uh, lavender. So you saw the lavender, you could smell the lavender. But then of course you also had the wallpaper. So you had this sort of unnatural or fake nature that was, uh, that was in relief, that was sort of framing the actual, the actual lavender. So already there we're dealing with uh, both natural and unnatural elements in, in, in some ways, or images of nature and then like um, images of vegetation and then real, real vegetation. But then more interestingly were the lights in the space, which of course these are plants that photosynthesize, they need, they need light, um, and the light would nurture the, the plants. But the light was rigged to um, uh, Twitter, and the more tweets there would be, the more light the plants would get. And what we've come to find, unfortunately, is that when it comes to viral information, especially things being retweeted and social uh, you know, activity on social media, it seems that misinformation um, and more hateful forms of speech uh, go viral much more quickly uh, and much more voluminously. And the artist was not unaware of this. Uh, and so he realized that when something went viral, it was often probably uh, not such great news. Uh, it could be, you know, like misinformation or, or, or hateful, uh, hateful speech. And the fact that this was done in 2017, I think, is not lost on any one of us. Um, and so in this perverse way, these, these plants, this lavender, which is known uh, to soothe depression, uh, like lavender, we now know it's actually a, a powerful um, aromatic, it's a powerful plant to treat stress, anxiety, and depression, was itself being nurtured by uh, social media, which is often so vitriolic uh, and, 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 and violent. Um, and misinformative, not always, uh, but but that seems to be the one one of the one of the big realizations we've had in the past decade. And so it's almost like the plants are taking in this negative energy um, and then trying to sort of deal with it uh, and emit, you know, like um, um, more healthful 
um, and, and soothing vibes within, within, within this gallery. So it's a very beautiful poetic work that really needs to be explained, and I've hope, I hope I've explained it properly. But it's also a work that is an indelible entanglement between the social and the natural, right? Um, and even there are feedback loops and connections and entanglements between us, the gallery goer, the plants, uh, cyberspace, Twitter, so on and so forth. All of it is connected in such a way that, that um, uh, makes us completely lose sight of the fact that uh, uh, of, of nature as something that's independent from us. Uh, but, but this is a, like a thoroughly entangled feedback loop between uh, vegetation, uh, speech online, and us as gallery goers. So it's a beautiful work that again, I think gets us to this idea of, uh, of, of, of the post of the post natural. Um, and one final, one final example with, which I'll leave you with is by a French artist, his name is Philip Pereno. And this is a big work that he did at the Tate Modern in London. It was called Any When. Um, and it's also a, com a complex work. There was a, a large video projection. This is, a, the, this is in the Tate Turbine. It's a huge, huge hall. It was a former factory. Um, so if you ever listen, if you visit London, definitely go visit the Tate. It's a really impressive museum. So there was a large screen with uh, a video that showed cuttlefish, these amazing cephalopods that we're learning all sorts of amazing things about, uh, super, super smart animals. Um, so they're there on, on the screen. And then you have people that would g gather and look um, um, and, and watch, the, watch the video. And then there were all these pulleys and levees that were in the space, uh, along with a floating fish, uh, like, a, like, a, a, like a, a balloon fish, um, that would move. And it would move according to the number of people in the space and the presence of people in the space. That somehow, and Philip Pereno is going to explain it to you in this video I'm going to leave you with, uh, somehow there was a yeast, there was a type of yeast that was interacting with human presence and the variability of the humans inside of this space. And the way in which these humans were interacting with the yeast Again, not directly. That most people didn't even know it was there. The yeast was like somewhere up in the in the in the ceiling. Uh, but nonetheless, the way in which their presence affected the way the yeast was, uh, you know, yeast is not alive in the in the sense of an animal, uh, but it is something that has processes. It is something that um, um, is is kind of living in in a certain respect, which is how bread can rise, right? Uh, the yeast is having all these interactions with, with, with the human presence. Um, so again, this idea, uh, I mean, there's just, just wonderful interplay between the, the, uh, the cuttlefish and the human, the air in the space, uh, the molecules being emitted by, by humans uh, that interact with the molecules inside of the yeast. Uh, that then condition the way the space looks with these levers and pulleys and things going up and down. Um, so fully scrambling the idea of people on one side and then the environment on the other, really thematizing front and center the idea that people and the environment are wholly entangled in such a way that I think we, we have to stop thinking of them as, extric as extricable from, from one another, which again, this is a driving thought for this session. Uh, which is, in short, thinking of the environment as post-natural. So let me leave you, let me show you this video um, where Philip Pereno is explaining his work. So you enter into a space, it's big, people keep saying it's a large turbine hall. But and also at the end of you have a little room where you have this like microorganism that controls you. So it's a bit of a game with a, a sense of perspective in a way. The building basically becomes a sort of, a, I would say, an automaton. The automaton is sensitive, let's say, you know, to, to some inputs. If it's 
it's rain outside, you may start to have a lot of oxygen feeding the heat. They will react accordingly and change things inside. It's kind of like question this idea of uh, machine and life. The title is Anyone. The first one was not Anyone, was Then About. It was so a game onto this idea of uh, time and space kind of wandering, you know. People use the space a bit the way they use a park. I want to have also something that move, not because I make them moving, but just because I move, because I follow the vortex. The cephalopods are fantastic creatures. They move, they change colors. It's a division turned a bit like a cephalopod. It's a weird uh, half uh, organic and half mechanic. 